Hi, this is Intias Papad and welcome to the last episode of Access TV on this set on Channel 4. And I'm Yana Kalanzi and today's program will have Stephen Lynn speak to the Africa Great Lakes about the Harambe Coover Festival. Hi, and Sherry Dugo is back on her health segment uh, with Caitlin Yardley, a herbalist. That's right, and Patricia Kelly will be having her segment Food for Thought about raw foods. For the first time, uh, Jody Shalang will be talking to Edzi Edzed about the Outsider Festival. Who are you going to be speaking to today, today Amtiaz? I'm talking to uh, Islam Unraveled about uh, fighting Islamophobia. But first, we'll get to Sid Tan, who will be speaking to Yuli Chan, who is a part of the Chinatown Action Group. My four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Hello and welcome to Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. My name is Sid Tan and with me co-hosting this segment is Yuli Chan. Yuli Chan is with the Chinatown Action Group as I am, full disclosure. Welcome to the show, Yuli. Tell us about the Chinatown Action Group. Um, Chinatown Action Group is an intergenerational collective of Chinese people, people of Chinese descent organizing for uh, people power and social justice on uh, unceded Coast Salish uh, lands. Uh, last month on the show, my fellow uh, Chinatown Action Group members, Janie and Stephanie, were here to talk about the People's Vision for Chinatown. It's a strategy for social and economic development. Uh, for Chinatown that centers on the needs of working class people and we developed this strategy along with low-income residents in the neighborhood in response to the devastating effects that economic revitalization has had on the community. The City of Vancouver's Chinatown Economic Revitalization Strategy which was first implemented in 2012 following the controversial Heights Review in 2011. You wrote an article in 2011 for the Georgia Strait titled Si Chao Tan on Vancouver 125. Remember that Saltwater City was born in downtown east side. You write the city planning fallback is a revitalization plan that Chinatown landowners, businessmen and social and cultural organizations have worked on for 10 years. Can you talk about the lessons you've learned from the beginnings of the Chinatown economic revitalization strategy? Well, the major lesson that I learned from the economic revitalization strategy back then, uh, Vincent Chan so eloquently points it out in this video we're about to show you. Well, we're seeing more seniors housing in no. government. No. To help to rebuild all of the old because buildings in China when you, the housing, right? when you did the hub, you didn't get any input from any Chinese at all, period. And then you and your cronies just... No, we just had 10 years of work. No, the you didn't get any input. No input. There was never any input. There were so many Chinatown merchants, small merchants, I'm not talking about chain or anything, and, uh, and people that lived in Chinatown had never heard about the process, had never heard about the Historic Area Heights mm -hmm. Review. And the lesson learned from this is that the government can pretty much do whatever it wants because if you know about what happened is that there was a local area planning process. The historic Chinatown area was taken out of that historic uh, planning process which included the eight districts of the downtown east side. It was taken out, those two monstrosities on either side of Kiefer and Maine were erected and they have really no place in Chinatown to look like that. They look like Yale Town. You can't tell this is Chinatown when you look at those buildings. And I think it's really important that the, the Chinatown Revitalization Committee, that was the one that was studying it for 10 years, which were of landowners and, uh, and uh, business owners and, and organizations. They got it wrong. They got it wrong and now they're trying to correct it all. And, and good for them for trying to correct it all, but the question is, 
why did they get it wrong? And I would say the reason they got it wrong was that a lot of the people that allowed that historic height review to go through, Chinatown to be taken out, had a different philosophy than the early uh, founders and builders of Chinatown. These people were just after a quick buck. They were, to put it no other way, they were the developers' flunkies. The lesson we learned is that with a government which is beholden to developers as our current majority controlled council, Vision Vancouver is, you can always expect this. This is what's been happening and this is my fear. And I hope we, uh, you and others that are getting so active in this will learn that governments can pretty much do what they want if the people don't keep their feet to the fire. Mm -hmm. You know, as someone who is relatively new to organizing specifically around Chinatown, I think it's so important um, to draw from the lessons of the past in the community, um, especially because Chinatown has been undergoing um, many periods of uh, significant uh, redevelopment um, and you know uh, as someone um, who uh, is a part of Chinatown group we're trying to create an intergenerational uh, community and it's so great to work with people like you um, in our struggle uh, for social justice in Chinatown. So I um, I just wanted to share some quick lessons for me. It's very clear that you know history is repeating itself not, not only through what you've shared um, but also in what we can learn from the struggle against 105 Kiefer. Um, I, I think one of the lessons um, that we're seeing, uh, one, one of the really big lessons for me is in how the city uh, continues to approach issues relating to Chinatown and the Chinese community. It's a very condescending and bureaucratic manner. Um, you know, we can see it very clearly in the way that they view Chinatown as this dying neighborhood um, in need of revitalization. It reduces our community to objects for the development and profiting of, for others. Um, you know, we're also seeing this um, recurring theme of inaccessible decision making. Um, the lack of genuine consultation with the community from the very beginning of any project, um, of any neighborhood plan, from something as significant as, you know, building the freeway and wanting to build the freeway in the late 60s to the Heights Review to um, the Chinatown Economic Revitalization to 105 Kiefer. Um, this pattern continues. Um, and you know, one really big lesson that you've pointed out as well is that the city nor us can really look to business people in our community as leaders when they have no interest in the needs and well-being of low-income residents. Chinatown is really about to be wiped off the face of Vancouver precisely because of this economic revitalization strategy and we have to be honest and acknowledge that the old styles of leadership um, have failed a significant part of this community and so uh, we really have to look for more creative and collaborative ways to come together as a community and to try something different and you know and to really ask you know why are low-income seniors living in isolation and poverty um, why do they not have enough to eat that they have to go to food banks and fight with other people in the community to eat canned, uh, canned foods so these are questions that we really have to ask ourselves and ultimately why do we keep wanting um, to push for economic revitalization and why don't we talk about what is really the quality of life that we want Yuli, um, we have to go now. Okay. So I'm just wondering, when people want to join in and want to help, how can they get a hold of the Chinatown Action Group? Uh, people can find us on uh, Facebook at Chinatown Action Group. Um, they can also find us on Twitter at Chinatown Action. Uh, we also have a website now, which is ChinatownAction.org, or uh, people can also send us an email at ChinatownActionGroup at gmail.com. Thank you for being with us, Yuli. Thank you for watching Access Community Television. My name is Sid Tan. I've been here with Julie Chan to talk about what has been going on in Chinatown. Until we meet again, straight shooting and tight edits. Thank you for watching. All right, I'm Gennaro Sullivan, and this is Access Television. Today we have with us Pam Bentley, the Director of Member Services at Co-op Radio. Uh, today, also, we want to bring you the Co-op Radio experience. <laughs>
That's right. We've got a lot of programs that are in languages uh, besides English. Mm -hmm. And we've got music programs, we've got current affairs, um, and all of those are done from different perspective than you would get in mainstream media. We have arts programming, storytelling, poetry, uh, that sort of thing. Oh my goodness. We even have a Hawaiian show. That's true. At our station. It's a, it's a music show. And a it Hawaiian takes a village, show. which is one of the long standing programs along with Klahalia FM. About parenting and then mm -hmm. uh, view, news and views from an indigenous perspective. Uh -huh. Klahalia, correct? Yeah, yeah. Klahalia FM. Got that right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you had asked us here today because uh, we're settling back into our old space on Columbia Street. We've got a new address, it's 370, but it's still the same door. Okay. And um, we are we're live broadcasting as of the last week in July. Wow. And we had expected to be back there a long time ago, like a, about a year and a half. We've been at our temporary location on Wall Street for three years, and we thought it was only going to be a year and a half. Yeah, but it's now complicated. We're, yes, yes. Well, you know how renovations go. Things always get delayed. Well, gentrification, more yeah. specifically. Well, it we're was the SRO that was being... Um, it was, yeah, it was the SRO upstairs that was being renovated. Yeah, because it was also like, it used to be the Sunrise Hotel. And now know, it's the Irving. Yeah. Because that's what it was originally when it was built. Really? Yeah, originally it was the Irving wow. Hotel, and so they've gone back to the original name. I had no idea, really. Yeah. It's amazing. So Co-op Radio has been up and running since 1975. That's right, 42 years, 42, 42 and a half years, years now. My goodness. Yeah. You know, and it's gone through a lot of changes. Uh, we've had various station managers from Ian Pringle, Alan Jensen. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. We've even had a Metis lady. Did you know that we had a, a Metis lady? who is one of the station managers That's at great. Radio? That's yeah. great. Yeah. And of course, because it's been 42 years, it hasn't been the same people the whole time. No. <laughs> it's forever different, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So we're really happy to be back in the downtown east side, because that's where Co-op Radio started in 1975. And why is Pigeon it important Park. to have a radio station in the downtown east side? Tell well, because we are, we are providing space on air for marginalized voices, mm -hmm. and we're providing um, stories and perspectives that might not be covered in mainstream media. Might not. Might not be covered in mainstream media in the same way. Yeah. Right? They, the, maybe the story is covered, but maybe it's done in a slightly different tone or angle or whatever. And so being in the downtown east side where our roots are, I think it keeps us real. And I think that it provides access to media production uh, from for people who live in that area. Well, it gives people of the downtown east side against a great sense of community and pride that uh, we are there and you know that the people of the downtown east side and the issues surrounding them are very rarely covered in mainstream media you mm -hmm. know there's a lot of violence that happens down there people who have been injured or murdered it never mm -hmm. gets covered on mainstream media which yeah. i find really surprising yeah there's an incredible amount of resilience mm -hmm. in that in that community and um, yeah so I think that matches I mean co-op radio has been pretty resilient to last this long as well well we sure have and when you consider that uh, co-op radio most of our funding is basically uh, it's it's based on membership which right. is where you come in you're right. the the uh, director of membership uh, Services, yeah, Services. and uh, the the move we've been able to do the the we the first move when we had to move from Columbia Street because mm -hmm. the renovations were going to happen uh, was totally unexpected, and so we had to use money from our operating budget to pay for that, and then we raised a little bit of money and people gave a little bit extra. Mm -hmm. This time, because we knew it was coming, yeah. the board of directors made the decision that we were going to move back because mm -hmm. it gives us more space, yeah. and it's uh, it can be sustained because our rent is so low there. Yeah. So we are setting ourselves up to continue into the next decades. And um, we knew this move was coming, so we were able to apply for grants to help with aspects of it. We were able to do fundraising in the last fall member drive where we asked people to give a little bit extra. We had a very generous donor say that he would match up to ten thousand dollars everything that people gave so we were able to pay for this move back without touching the co-op radio regular operating budget okay. so that is a huge success and that's because of our members 
awesome members we have at Cooperative on. Every member owns a little piece of the station. That's right. It's because it's a cooperative, every member is an owner of the station. And when you are a member, you can get involved with the programming if you want. You can come and get involved on committees. You can get involved as little or as much. Like So if you just want to listen, you know as a member that you had a part in what's on air. Yeah, what a great way uh, to support various initiatives in our community and when you look at what is going on uh, in First Nations community in particular with fish farms and you know the Site C Dam and the Kinder Morgan pipeline it's very valuable to us to have that space and time to facilitate the voices of our community who are very concerned about the environment and Mother Earth right now. Yeah, we really yeah. appreciate all the Indigenous programming that you do on Co-op Radio. And um, we're so, like, I say we, but that includes, like, us, right? Are so happy to have that space. Yeah. We have spaces that are open right now for mm -hmm. programming, so people can come and go to Station Orientation. The next one is the third week of of August the okay. second on a Tuesday 6 30 at 370 Columbia yeah. Street so come and do the station orientation see if it's for you and then get involved yeah definitely you know you can take policy training uh, you could t learn how to become a certified operator and uh, then you could come and sit in with me on one of my programs I'm on the air Monday between 1 o'clock and 2 30 on when spirit whispers Tuesdays from 1 o'clock till 2 on snow wild and then Thursdays from 5 o'clock to 6, and I'm always looking for people to volunteer and help me hold down this sport of communication. Yeah, it takes a lot of people to make a, a radio show. Definitely. Before we go, tell us how we can become a member at Co-op Radio. So you can become a member by calling 604-684-8494, extension 230. You'll talk to me or you'll leave a message for me. You can also email me at community at coopradio.org. There's no hyphen, so it's community at coopradio.org. Yeah. Or you can go to our website and there's a little donate to co-op radio so yeah. you don't even have to become a member if you don't want to get involved and you just want to support co-op radio we have people who support co-op radio that don't even listen to it they just are so happy that it exists good yeah okay and the other thing if you would like to have your own program at co-op radio you can contact uh, programs at co-op radio.org and talk to Leela Chinia thank you for joining us on access television Oh. They camped there, and I'll bet they camped at the mouth of Tomato yeah. Creek. I would a whole years ago. This great place where they could graze their horses, etc. And then, like I said, there's going to be places where they stopped and let people off and got them on, on the steamboat. hear the indigenous voice. This is MTS Puppet here at Access TV, and on the set I have with me uh, Harun Khan, who's actually been on the set before, and Mohammed Azim from Islam Unraveled. Thank you for being here. Um, you're doing important work in, in fighting uh, Islamophobia. So tell us, what is Islam Unraveled? So is Islam un Unraveled, in, in a, a very short objective, um, uh, it's a learning and uh, living together. Uh, there are more than a million Muslims. Um, in, in the lower mainland, there's more than 120,000 Muslims. Over the years, uh, as, as uh, immigration has happened, as, as refugees have, have come, um, it's, the, the Muslim population has, has, has uh, increased. Um, looking at a, a, just a, a microcosm of, of uh, one city, the city of Surrey, for example, uh, there's 1,200 people moving in, in, into the city uh, a, 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 a a month, mm -hmm. and um, what's what's happening is quite a, quite a few of them are, are, are Muslims. Uh, traditionally, there's this fear of the unknown. Uh, you don't know who, what Islam is, what Muslims, uh, who Muslims are. So there was the, the slight hint of of uh, discrimination. Some some prejudice was was experienced, but over the the last uh, four or five years, uh, we have seen um, a, a tremendous amount of, of increase in in hate. Uh, Islamophobic uh, hate and, and and hate crimes, yeah. and um, and uh, our, our mandate was to to educate institutions and to, to to the mainstream community who Muslims are that we live next to you, we go to work, we are an educated demographic as well, and and just just to 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 build bridges. However, uh, over the last uh, last few uh, few months, the last year. 
uh, uh, post uh, Quebec City uh, uh, right. shootings, uh, we were left no choice. Uh, we had to totally focus yeah. on on just just combating so um, the Islamophobia. Do the work of education, making people aware. Harun, we've seen the latest stats that Islamophobia is on the rise. How do we fight this uh, form of racism, the Islamophobia? Well, I think the, the word is not just to fight it, it's to dispel ignorance, really. Mm -hmm. and, and so this goes to the education, also goes to engagement. W what is it that you do? Uh, we're, no, we're not the other, we're, we're your neighbor, we're mm -hmm. your friend, we're, your, uh, uh, we're part of humanity. Mm -hmm. And really this, is, this is, it goes to the crux of who we are as people, as human beings. Mm -hmm. And Islam Unraveled is a way of dispelling myths, misconceptions, sort of showing um, who we are as a people. People. And a lot of it uh, goes down to ignorance. When you have an ignorance breeds hate uh, because it's a fear of the unknown. People are afraid and that fear gets ratcheted up with the rhetoric that goes on with various uh, right-wing organizations, alt-right. You've seen the rise of the KKK. You yourself have, uh, have witnessed it firsthand. Um, the Sons of Odin and people who've really uh, grasped onto Someone to blame, someone to, uh, to, to blame on their, their problems. So give us an example. What are the, some of the work that you're doing in terms of uh, um, making people aware uh, 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 dispelling the myth of so sure. one of the one of the programs that's really gained attention <coughs> is we've been we've been working with uh, all of the levels of RCMP. Um, so the, the the E division, the diversity, the crime stoppers, and, and we managed to get them all to, uh, in, in one room. And uh, we're we are rolling out these programs, and and one of the very uh, simple things we've been doing is every Friday, which is our which is the Muslim Sabbath, the Jummah. Uh, so uh, at the Jummah prayers, uh, there is uh, this 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 period called the Khutbah. So uh, that that's the, that's the sermon, and immediately thereafter, we're inviting uh, the Translink police and the RCMP, and they they stand there, and uh, it, it's a it's a five minute uh, empowerment where they they they. They coach Muslims. Okay, if you're on a sky train and somebody's harassing you, well, you know what are the things to do? What and, and, and you know how do you? Right. Uh, and they've got uh, a method where you uh, you text. So if somebody is really in your face and you know you're being threatened, everybody seems to be on on on, on the phone. Well, this is great. I know we've got the website. I know we're running out of time quickly. Mm -hmm. But Harun, I just want to quickly mention that uh, August 13th <coughs> is. Uh, the Pakistan festival happening here at, at Holland Park. Tell us a little bit about that. Absolutely. So, uh, so it's from the Pakistan Canada Association. We also host the Al Jamia Masjid, the first mosque established in BC. So it's something that we've been doing for the last several years. This year it'll be right here. We'll be uh, at at the Jack Pool Plaza around the uh, Olympic torch. Be a very great time, great family evening, a free evening. Great. And uh, we'll have Sana Marwi, who's uh, one Perfect. of the one of the best yeah. um, entertainers out of Pakistan, right. who will be well, attending. Thank you. For for both for being yeah. here and, and we'll bring you back on uh, on Access TV talk more thank about you. the work yeah. you're doing in Islam and Revel. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Mr. Up next, Stephen Lynn will be talking with the Africa Great Lakes Networking Foundation about their upcoming event, the Harambe Coover Festival. Hello, my name is Stephen Lynn, host of uh, Access Community Television. I'm proud and uh, honored to have guests, my guest today, um, Kombi Nanjala, Salman Alam, uh, Ali Sirig Eldin, and Coyote Fotoba, uh, who is the uh, producer uh, of, of Harambe, Vancouver. We're, we're going to be talking about the parade, and uh, we're, we're here to learn more about Harambe, Vancouver parade, which has grown out of the Pan-African Carnival. Harambe, tell us about that. Kombi? Yeah, thank you very much for having me. My name is Kombi Nanjala. I'm the director of African Great Lakes Networking Foundation. And today I'm here to just introduce you to the team that is going to be behind the uh, Harambe Guva 2017. Uh, we had our first uh, Pan-African uh, Parade Dialogue in 2016. And we just wanted to create awareness about the history of uh, Hogan's Alley, how our people were displaced in 1970. And what inspired me most was the parade, the pride parade that we organized during that time. 
for the Black Lives Matter. And we are here also to promote the United Nations Declaration of the People of African Descent 2015-2024. And this is the reason why we are here today and I'll hand over to Salmon. Thank you for having me. Salman, uh, thank you very much, Kombi, and uh, thank you very much, Stephen, uh, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Salman. I'm a UBC student. I'm also the first president of uh, Great Lakes Canada Foundation, uh, which is being spearheaded by uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Lytton himself. Uh, the Great Lakes Canada is a foundation which works with the different communities in the downtown east side to bring them together and to work on the diversity and diversity reconciliation as well as uh, integration. Uh, the idea of Harambe Coover uh, actually started last year when uh, Combi partnered with uh, Stephen Lytton himself uh, to bring, to work with different communities uh, and as well as bring in uh, the aspect of reconciliation. Uh, the word Harambe Coover uh, comes from a Swahili word uh, togetherness so it is it is about bringing the different communities which were marginalized and displaced historically in the downtown east side community uh, this started uh, from a from a very long time ago uh, starting in 1885 the chinese head tax which was imposed in the chinese community in chinatown in downtown east side uh, then the then the kumagaru matu incident in uh, 1914 when a ship was uh, turned away uh, like in the Vancouver port uh, this ship comprised of people of uh, Southeast Asian descent uh, then then it goes to the World War II incident uh, in 1942 when uh, Japanese Canadians were interned and displaced and uh, most recently the Hogan's Valley incident where black African communities were displaced with the construction of the Georgia Viaduct. Mm -hmm. uh, so the theme of Harambe Coover is basically uh, to highlight all the different, uh, to highlight and also bring awareness about all these different issues that has been taking place and also focus on uh, uh, cultural pride, uh, cultural pride, reconciliation and integration. Mm. Awesome. Really? Thank you so much, Stephen, for having us. And I'm really so excited to be part of such a, an amazing initiative. Um, I'm the Vice President of Great Lakes Canada Foundation, and I work with Selman and the team. And it's really amazing how Canada is such a role model for countries around the world with our initiative and our move towards truth and reconciliation. You could see many countries around the world trying to imitate that uh, those those things that we're spearheading. For example, in Indonesia last year, I think President Jokowi introduced a symposium to look into the <coughs> mass killings that happened uh, during the anti-communist purges in 1965 and 1966. And in a lot of ways, Canada is inspiring the world to do all of these great things, to look towards the history, to bring different ethnic groups together towards truth and reconciliation. But there's still really a lot more we could do here in Canada. And what I love so much is this initiative that we're doing coincides with Canada 150 Confederation, right? And there are so many different perspectives about that. Is it 150 years of Confederation, like bringing different peoples together, or 150 years of colonialization? And these are dialogues that we're going to have, and I think that it's amazing what we're doing. Um, I definitely can't up the amazing um, social advocacy component of um, this project, but as a creative producer, part of my job is sort of taking in the ecological history and um, the progressive um, focus of the entire organization experientially from, you know, you and Combi um, having lived through so much um, different decades of what I believe is um, the transform the transformation of Canada into such a beautiful place and um, around Vancouver is about celebration and when we talk about cultural pride we have to look at 
everything um, as meaningful. The clothes that um, are going to be displayed at the event, the dance that's going to be presented, um, the types of food that you're going to have experienced, the artists. We have an headliner, um, DJ D-Max, who um, was actually the headliner at Harvard um, for African Business Week, and um, he's coming to Vancouver because of um, the importance of um, this type of event. So um, we're, you know, at one level trying to um, produce something that's globally significant, but at the same time we are going to the grassroots culture and um, looking at the indigenous um, artists and um, creators that we have as well as um, those of um, you know African descent within the larger multicultural um, communities to create this programming that we're going to bring. Um, the first day we'll focus on dialogue and this year the theme is integration. The second day um, will be a celebration in the park and we're going to have a wide range of artists, dancers, um, vendors, um, the community is going to come together in a jam of, you know, to celebrate um, us as Canadians in an amazing way, especially given it's Canada 150. And the third day will be mobile. So we'll be, um, you know, going um, all the way around Maine to East, East Hastings and really dancing in a way that um, has never really been experienced in that area before. Um, a lot of people, you know, when you hear Hastings, what comes to your mind is completely different. It's not, um, the same emotions when you think of Granville Strip, right? And for the f first time, we're rejuvenating um, this community um, with, you know, art and culture, and hopefully with um, the tearing down of the viaduct and um, us bringing out this awareness campaign, we can mobilize more people to join us. So August 25th to the 28th is around Vancouver, um, Vancouver's newest multicultural um, parade with a focus on diversity and reconciliation. How do people get in touch with you? We have a website, um, so www.harambecouver.ca. So that's Harambe, H-A-R-A-M-B-E, Coover, C-O-U-V-E-R.ca. And this is a this is a ten year pro process, Combi. Uh, for, and the goal is to address this to the Secretary of the United Nations? Yes, this we have just picked it. The United Nations declared 2015-2024 as the year f uh, to recognize what the uh, people of African descent have gone through from uh, trans, uh, uh, trans slave trade to today. We still face the same injustices and this is why we want to sit together like this um, dialogue will be something that we can pick something from it and forward it to the working committee in Geneva to see if the government of Canada can be flexible to change these policies that we feel are not favoring us as black people. Is there any final word that you have, would like to add? Uh, so I would like to actually invite everyone to the Haram Vancouver Parade which will uh, take place on, uh, on August 27th uh, uh, and uh, that's all. Uh, and yourself? Haram Vancouver is creating a legacy and I strongly encourage everyone to be a part of that legacy as Canadians, as people that want to work towards reconciliation and justice. And this is an amazing opportunity and amazing time and amazing event that's happening. I'd like to thank my guests for coming. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to Harambe Van, uh, Harambe Vancouver. Hello there, I'm Patricia Kelly. Uh, today Bradley Hawkins is not able to join us, but what I thought I'd share with you today is uh, my summer breakfast and my summer lunch. And both are really easy, they're portable, they're healthy, and they're both raw. So it's summertime now, so it's a really good time to put a lot more raw foods, fruits and vegetables into your diet but you may not have thought of putting raw seeds into your diet. 
So this is actually my breakfast over here. Now I haven't blended it yet, but what I've got is a combination of hemp, coconut, flax, pumpkin seed, sunflower seed, and I also put in sesame seed as well. And I soak it overnight. You've got to soak it for about 12 or 24 hours, and you drain it the next day, and then you just blend it up. And it kind of turns into something that kind of looks like oatmeal. Oatmeal's my favorite breakfast in the winter, and it's got the same kind of texture, but it's really low in carbohydrates, and it's also raw. So it's got those raw enzymes that you get with the food that we all kind of need in our diet. Now enzymes, our body also produces enzymes as well. But if we eat a lot of processed and packaged foods over the year, our body is not going to be able to produce enough enzymes to completely digest all of our food. And the result of that, if we have an enzyme deficiency, is probably food intolerances and reactions to food and a lot of different digestive problems. So the digestive problems could be anything from heartburn to bloating to diarrhea to constipation to gas. So all those really kind of uh, awkward things that nobody likes to talk about, but you know, we all get from time to time. So summer's a really good time to add some raw into your diet. And then my lunch is also raw. So of course it's the perfect time to eat a salad, just whatever happens to be in season. You can put in some you know, different herbs that you're growing into in your garden or in pots, some avocado, and then put some sprouts in because sprouts, like the seeds, they also have a lot of enzymes in them too. So what I like to do is I make my own blend. I mean, you can get a really good blend at the farmer's market, or you can just blend up some, so you can just sprout some lentils, some mung beans, and some radishes. And so there you go. It's uh, vegan, it's healthy, it's uh, easy to make, and it's uh, really good for you. So we'll see you next month. Thank you for joining us. Hey Vancouver, this is Jody Wenchleg of Access TV. Today I have the pleasure of highlighting the inaugural Vancouver Outsider Art Festival. Uh, it's going to be on August 11th and 12th at the Roundhouse Community Centre in Vancouver. And here with me to represent the festival and explain more about it is artist Edzi Edzed. Welcome back, Edzi. Hello there, Jody, <laughs> and thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure. Uh, you're uh, a multidisciplinary artist yourself, and one of over 50 visual and performing artists in the festival. That's right. Uh, I am an artist, and I am an exhibitor in this particular festival. And I was asked by uh, CACV, which is the Community uh, Arts F uh, Council for Vancouver, have asked me to uh, help them organize this VOAF uh, Vancouver Outsider Arts Festival, mm -hmm. and uh, so here we are. That's great. That's great. Yeah, and it's and uh, you you've been here before, as I said, and we've talked about this program before. But I think a good place to start would be to remind us about what is outsider art. All of the artists in this particular festival, including myself, have uh, self-identified as uh, outsider artists. And it has a certain kind of a connotation. In the past, uh, outsider art was also uh, um, art brut, which started in Europe and uh, mm -hmm. uh, has been now shown in London and Paris and New York. And this is the first time for Vancouver, really. But. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, what it comes down to is that there are numbers of barriers that some of these artists face uh, from getting into the mainstream art world, and right. uh, that's right. what we're trying to overcome. Right, right. Well, it's a great it's a great thing to uh, to have in Vancouver, mm -hmm. and uh, since it is celebrated across Europe in museums and also in the Outsider Art Fair in um, in New York for years, mm -hmm. so. What brings it to Vancouver now? Well, Pierre Lechner is an artist as well, and he was the past president for CACV. And uh, he began that process uh, years ago. And now he's the artistic director for CACV, and uh, we'll attribute everything to him. Mm, okay, so it was his vision to, to his bring vision. it out here. Okay, that's fantastic. So uh, then uh, when the fest festival day comes, what can festival goers expect to see when they come? See and do? Lots. Okay. And um, <laughs> Friday and Saturday is uh, actually, that's August 11th and 12th. Uh -huh. uh, 
uh, there's going to be a number of exhibitors that are visual artists, and that can mean paintings and uh, sculptures and prints. All of them are for exhibit, of course, mm -hmm. but we're also expecting some sales, and perhaps a lot of sales. And uh, uh, there's a lot of talent there in terms of uh, performance uh, and uh, music oh. and uh, and theater. What so there, there's a little bit for everybody. Anything special? Well, especially on uh, on Friday at seven o'clock, there's going to be the illicit uh, uh, workshop performance, and I think that's uh, that's uh, audience uh, participatory. Ooh. So that might be very interesting. But starting uh -huh. at about one o'clock, I think on Saturday, there's going to be ten different performances that uh, that uh, run through the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people will be very interested in the dance and the songs, et cetera, and uh, singing, dancing, and mm -hmm. theater, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's you fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Edzi. Um, I, I'm excited about checking out the fair myself. And mm, yeah. that uh, performance work sounds interesting. Maybe find something for my wall. Wonderful. Who knows? Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, so make sure you check out the Outsider Art Festival at the Roundhouse Community Center in Vancouver. Uh, it's going August 11th from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m. And on August 12th, that's the Saturday, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yes, and I might add something. Uh, maybe the public would want to go ahead and just check out VOAF online Absolutely. with a Google search, just to go and make sure that the schedule, you know, fits their fits Absolutely. their schedule. Yeah. Okay. If you want to know more, go online. Perfect. V Van Vancouver Outsider Art Festival. That's right. VOAF should be found online. online. Sounds good. Wonderful. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Up next is Sherry Dougal back with her health segment talking to Kathleen Yardley, herbalist. Hello everyone, welcome to my next health segment on Access Television. Today we have a brilliant herbalist here, well immersed in her craft. She recently published her book called The Good Living Guide to Natural and Herbal Remedies. She has a lot to talk about, so let's start with your book, Kathleen. Okay, Sherry. And uh, what inspired you to write this? Oh, well, being a herbalist for almost 20 years, I became inspired to write about the fine line between using plants as food and using plants as medicine. And I felt really, really passionate about the fact that a lot of people aren't even familiar with the plants or the local weeds that are growing nearby, let alone know how to use and prepare those plants as foods or as first aid or as medicine. It's kind of like the lost art of mm -hmm. using plants as medicine. It's become a lost art. And so the book was really inspired about uh, really connecting people back to nature and suggesting ways that they could start to incorporate plants into their kitchen, into their cooking, and into their first aid cabinets to really start to respect Mother Nature and know how, in fact, we're all connected. So starting to recognize local plants, starting to know how to use them as foods and medicine, and starting to respect Mother Earth Speaking as well. of recognizing local plants, I saw this beautiful photo, and all the photographs are taken by you. Yes, yes. I saw this beautiful one here. Why don't you tell us about <laughs> this little so this photo here? So this beautiful plant is Dacus carata, the Latin name, or mm -hmm. Queen Anne's Lace. The, um, the visuals of the, finely, um, the, the fine umbers in the plant almost resemble lace. And it is a local medicinal plant. Um, it, wild carrot is its uh, common name, so the root can actually be consumed as a, a bitter carrot or a food. Um, and it has a number of medicinal properties as well. And how can it be distinguished from other? Yeah, so, so talking about um, plant identification <clears throat> is really an important component of, of gathering herbs. And I don't suggest that anyone go out and start to gather herbs 
without any um, proper plant mm -hmm. identification experience or uh, experience from a, a herbalist who really is familiar with the local plant. Because it is a science. Absolutely. So uh, Queen Anne's lace is very similar to a plant, um, hemlock plant, which is actually poisonous. Yes. So it's very, very important to get uh, the accurate plant identification before harvesting any plant. There are lots of local plants, however, that are benign, they're nutritious, they are used for um, common first aid and foods as well, and very, very safe to harvest. And so it is a science, but you said that each herb has its own personality. Can yeah, you talk about that? Absolutely. We were talking about that before yeah. we came on air, and I kind of view plants like human beings as having their own kind of flavor, their own personality. So when starting to use herbal medicine for the first time and when teaching my students, I often speak about getting to know the personality of the plant. Wow. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is starting to do simple, starting to work with one particular plant for a week or two and getting to know is it bitter, is it salty in its flavor, is it slippery in its consistency or tart flavor, bitter, all of those flavors actually have certain Contribute properties. Contribute to the health Absolutely. properties to it. What are some misconceptions about herbal medicine? Well, one of the most common things that I've heard from many people is that there's no science backing herbal medicine. <laughs> and I, I smile uh -huh. because there's now masters of science degree programs in herbal medicine that are throughout the world. And so there, there is, in fact, science. 25% um, of mar modern pharmaceuticals are synthesized directly from plant medicine yep. or made artificially in a yep. lab to mirror the chemical components of plants. So there's been a great deal of research done on the uh, biochemistry and the chemical components of herbal medicine. And even pharmaceuticals today, you'd see a commercial. Take this, oh, but you have this side effect and that side effect and that side effect. Do these have a lot of side effects? It's a really great question, yeah. Sherry. Um, Generally speaking, the majority of herbs that are available over the counter or the majority of herbs that one would be recommended in a clinic environment with a, with a herbalist would be very, very benign. Good. And one of the reasons are that herbs are generally recommended in their whole herb form. So hundreds of chemical components are put, our Mother Nature has packed into that one plant. Yes. And those um, numerous components components have synergistic properties, buffering properties. Synergistic as in all the components work together. Absolutely. To give the whole. And buffering meaning minimizing the more stronger chemical components, so making them less powerful in the body. We have so much to talk about, but last but not least, what are some remedies that people can take on an everyday basis for general health maintenance yeah. that they can incorporate into their kitchen? So some um, a good starting point is getting to know um, one or two herbs, starting to work with one or two herbs on a long-term basis, and that would be called the art of simpling, so really working with one plant. But there are a group of herbs that are known as adaptogen herbs, and for people in the Western world and modern... For stress in absolutely, particular, adaptogenic yes. herbs. These herbs help the body adapt to change um, internal or external stress. They help to enhance immune system capacities. Um, a number of these herbs contain immune stimulating polysaccharides, so large um, complex carbohydrates essentially that stimulate an immune system response in the body. And what are some examples of those herbs you can put right in the kitchen? <laughs> so Siberian ginseng powder is a great uh, fabulous herb to add into a morning smoothie for its adaptogen properties, for energy, endurance, vitality, as well as immune system boosting. Another um, traditional Chinese medicine herb called Huang Qi, or Astragalus membranius, is a nutritive herb. Beautiful. There's so much you can incorporate into your own kitchen. Try a smoothie, that's a great idea. Get some rice milk or some almond milk in there, incorporate the herbs into your lifestyle, a way to maintain health. And it's a pleasure to have you at the studio. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back again here at My some pleasure. Point. Thank you. Well, that's it for the show, I'm Tiaz. Yeah, this is our last time on the set, uh, Yana, you know, but we're not going away. 
Uh, you can find us online uh, on, uh, and on Facebook. Um, so until then, this is Intia's Pop at saying see you later. And I'm Yana Kalanzi. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Hello and welcome to Access Community Television, shamelessly promoting our friends and community. My name is Sid Tan and we have one of our favorite friends with us here today in the studio, Jim Wang Chu. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thanks for having me, Sid. It's, it's so great to have you here. Uh, for those that are out there that don't know, Jim Wang Chu is a published poet, the co-editor of four anthologies of Chinese Canadian writing or Asian Canadian writing, among other things, as co-founder of the Asian Canadian Writers Workshop, Rice Paper Magazine, and also the Liter Asian Festival of Pacific Rim Asian Canadian Writing and Vancouver Asian Heritage Month. And my question is a very simple one, Jim. How do you find the time to do all this and what inspires you to do it? Uh, no inspiration there, Sid. Um, I think a lot of it is just youthful indiscretion. <laughs> you know, things that you don't think about. But in those days, we were just a bunch of young guys sitting around, Sky Lee, Paul Yee, many of us, belly aching in Chinatown, sitting in the cafe and asking questions. What if? Why is it the way it is? What if? And of course, the question goes to why not? And then after a while, you realize that you're, it's on you. If you don't make a stab at it, no, nothing will happen. So I think that that's how we got started in all this stuff. We were none of the basic. I didn't even write those days. And it was during that time that we just literally learned everything from scratch. However, um, you know, there's a saying. They say that, um, you know, knowledge sets you free. So I tell you, that's not true because knowledge actually enslaved you. Because as I got in deeper into the history of the Chinese Canadians and so on, I realized what happened. And that it was all these, you know, unkind legislations, uh, racist kind of uh, bylaws and stuff that created the circumstances where we were at. And I think that once you get angry, but the other thing is that you're forced to reckon with it. And if you're not happy with the reality you're in, you have to create a new reality. So that's what I did. I set on to creating a, real, a new reality. And that's where the cultural engineering comes from. That's right. And you have been doing a remarkable job. I've known you for over three decades. I've known what you've done. And in terms of cultural engineering, what led you to this, I know, was photography. And you've gone a circuitous route to literature and I'm just wondering how did that come about? Why from photography to poetry, which is literature, and then on to literature? Well I think the journey itself is just simply a self a journey of self-discovery. I finished about grade 10, I never completed grade 11 and I wasn't certain that I could even write and I think photography was the first thing that I felt I can grasp onto because I used to work in a Chinese cafe and photography and you know making prints and stuff is almost like cooking. So um, that's how I started using visual images. But then as you get more visual images and the more you want to talk, say about what you've taken in that picture, the more I realized I needed to write. So that's when I went into UBC and learned to write. You got into it in a big way and, and basically amongst other things that you've been doing, you, you have just had a, a photography exhibit at Santa Ray recently, which I attended. It was tremendous seeing all the writers and young people that are coming on. And I'm just wondering, what is in the foreground? What is coming up for you uh, in terms of what you're going to be doing? I know that you just re recently retired from your day job. What are you putting yourself into these days? Well, we recently completed uh, a uh, project for the uh, province of British Columbia. It's going to be a book on the Chinese in British Columbia. And it is a book that uh, I think the tentative title is uh, Go Mountain Dreams. But it is a book 
about the Chinese Canadian experience in British Columbia that um, is from the point of view of us, the Chinese that are that are involved with it. Because up to now, most of the books are usually about thir from a third person or an academic perspective. So that would be really unique. We are doing um, launching a uh, and uh, the the latest anthology, which is called Alliteration, and it's the twentieth anniversary of Rice Beer Magazine, so we actually put together a compilation of the best of the 20 years of uh, Rice Paper's writings that, are, that were in the magazine. So that will be uh, probably uh, launched in Asian Heritage Month this year. Yeah, tell us about this literation. Who are some of the authors that are in it from, from the long list of people that have oh, written for Rice Paper? It's everybody. Right? Everybody that's probably uh, you know, acknowledged. But the thing that's unique is that it's writing that they wrote specifically for the magazine, and it's probably never been seen outside of it. You have people like Evelyn Lau, Fred Waugh, uh, Sky Lee, um, um, Charlie Kagawa, uh, Terry Watara. There's, there's numerous, numerous names, and a lot of names that people may not have known about, but we felt that they were treasures, so we include them in, in this uh, edition. And so you've been a observer and an active participant in Chinatown for a long time. I noticed that the young people now are started getting involved. How do you feel about that very quickly? We have to go. Well, I think the young people that uh, are now is akin to the young people that we were back in the 70s. We were the young people. And I think these young people here, is, it, they're inspiring because the fact that they're coming down looking for their identity and also making a stand on issues that were very prevalent back in the 1970s, the freeway expropriation, and now it's you know gutting a Chinatown, and the redevelopment, and so on. So I give them all the power. Thank you for being with us today, Jim. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. You've been watching Access Community Television. My name is Sid Tan. We've been here with Jim Wong Chu, and until we meet again, straight shooting and tight edits. Coming up will be updates on the downtown east side and other neighbors on Hot Topics with Gennargi O'Sullivan and Guy Oustis on Access Community Television. You're my last tour of the day, folks. And on my last tour of the day, no hui. I like to let my hair down, drop the phony accent, and be me. Just me. I figure once a day, I've got to be me. That was Jim Wang Chu reading from Frank Chin's book, The Year of the Dragon. What's the story with this Guan Gong stuff? Is it true? Sure. I'm not surprised that Guangdong is the guy that's really behind the, uh, all the wealth and all the, all the uh, experience and all the power and all the, all the goodness that's uh, in Chinatown. I mean, Guangdong probably is, is the, you know, he may be the head right now of, uh, of corporate Chinese North America. Find that the spirit of Guangdong is all around us. Well, Guangdong is looked on more than anything else as an ancestral god. But I think Guangdong is a spirit. He's a spirit that's, that's alive. It's much more than, um, than simply an effigy or something of the past that you can, talk, you can tell little kids and there's a good story behind it. More than anything else, I think he exemplifies the spirit. My spirit is is what lives and sometimes you see that spirit a certain amount of pride a certain amount of of coming out and doing something that's beyond the call of your own duty or your confines your own station in life or even your own courage <laughs>